We gather this hour. We gather this hour. We gather this hour. We gather this hour as people of faith. As people of faith. As people of faith. As people of faith. With joys and sorrows. With joys and sorrows. With joys and sorrows. Gifts and needs. Gifts and needs. Gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope. We light this beacon of hope. We light this beacon of hope. Sign of our quest for truth and meaning. Sign of our quest for truth and meaning. In celebration. In celebration. In celebration. Of the life we share together. 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 We share together. We share together. We share together. Yes. So in our story, um, in our story for all ages today, uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, in the links that come out on Sunday morning, there's usually a, a you know, meditation in our playlist and also a story for all ages um, that I record earlier in the week. But anyway, in the story for all ages today, I shared I, this lovely little parable from the Reverend Christopher Buse. Um, and I really like this story, and I've, I know I've shared it before with the congregation. But in the story, there's this young queen of an island, and it's actually a child queen uh, of this little island. Um, and she learns from one of her advisors, one of her adult advisors, right, comes in and, and tells her that the next island over from theirs, from the one that she's the queen to, the next island over is home to their enemy. And shows she's kind of frightened by that thought. And she says, you know, she asked her advisor what she, what the advisor thought they should do about that. And the advisor says the best way to deal with an enemy was to send their soldiers over to the other island and destroy the enemy. The young queen thanked her advisor and has to think about it for a while. So then the next day comes and the advisor comes and finds the queen having tea with the queen of the neighboring island. And the advisor flies into this rage. How could she possibly sit down and have tea with her enemy? And the young queen uh, replies just simply. She says, she goes, well, one way of getting rid of your enemy is to destroy them. But the other way is to make that enemy a friend. So it's a cute little story, but I think its cuteness perhaps obscures a deeper importance in our lives. Now, we play in our lives, we play the principal role, the protagonist in the stories that make up our lives. And when I say stories, I'm pointing to the multiple overlapping narratives that form the world we exist within. And in each of those stories, we have a role to play. And the thing is, and you probably already understand this and know this, we rarely consciously choose those roles that we play in those stories. It's more like they're assigned to us. And at first we play along looking to the other people in our little narratives and figuring out what our lines should be, for example, or how we should act. Now, a good example, I'll give you this one. I am the youngest of my parents' four children. I'm also the only male among my siblings. So I got assigned roles in the family narrative. Son was one, brother, but most importantly, baby brother. It's a good role to have. And as our stories unfolded, I learned what my role was and how I was expected to interact with these people that were my family. And as I learned that role, the narratives formed the patterns of our lives together. But here's the thing. If you were today to put my sister Julie and I in the same room, in a matter of a few moments, we would revert to those roles we played when I was four and she was six. 
which were the exact same relational roles we played when I was 14 and she was 16. You'd see the same teasing, hear the same laughter. My sister, always the moderator of fairness in our family and always my personal protector, would still want to make sure I got an equal share, be that of attention or cookies. Friends, I am a grown ass man and she's a grown ass woman and we still act out the roles we learned by heart when we were not much more than toddlers. In his book, there's this wonderful book by uh, an author named David Loy. He's a, he comes to us from the Buddhist tradition and he has a book called The World is Made of Stories. And in that book, he reminds us that the roles we play and the stories in which we play them constitute our identity. The roles my sister Julie and I play every time we see each other confirm and affirm our identity as sister and brother. And I'm guessing that when I'm 90 and she's 92, I'm still going to tease her in the same way. And she's still going to make sure I get a cookie. But what happens, friends, if we need to change the narrative? What happens when the story we are living is not the one we desire, the story we can imagine for ourselves that is luminous and tantalizingly close, but we can't seem to enact or embody that new narrative? David Loy, going back to David Loy's book, he teaches us, he actually is just reminding us that there is this power we have, this is power we all possess. And that is the freedom to change the role we have been assigned and to give ourselves a new role. The freedom to change the role we have been assigned and to give ourselves a new role. But first, to do this, friends, we need to recognize the story that we are in in that moment and the role we are playing in it. And we need to recognize that that's not working. It's not giving us what we need to grow, to grow spiritually, to grow emotionally, intellectually. It is somehow limiting us, restraining us from living our deepest values. So we need to recognize the story and the role we're playing in it and seeing when they're not working, when those stories aren't working, see how they are um, restraining us from living our deepest values. Why don't you imagine with me just for a moment? So there's this well-worn narrative in this country right now that is the story of what happens when a white police officer encounters a black man. And I promise you, just as soon as I said that, I'm guessing you already know the ending. Both of those people enter into the encounter, into their roles, in their respective roles, the ones assigned to them kind of by the narrative itself, and also the roles each assigns to the other. And one way that narrative, this goes, follows that narrative we've become so familiar with, and so often ends up with the black man being dead. But I want you to think about this for a minute. What do you think might occur if either or both of these people choose to play a different role? Instead of entering into that story in fear as enemies, as their role would seem to require, what would happen if they entered into that story with empathy, with compassion? Friends, when we change the role, we change the story. And when we change the story, we change the world. Which is what makes that cute little Christopher abuse parable so important. We could easily see how that young queen in that story could have played the role her advisor assigned her. She might have even decided to send the soldiers over to destroy the enemy on the next island, but, but she instead changed roles, choosing instead to create a friendship rather than destroy an enemy. 
And friends, yeah, I actually think it is that simple and that complicated. It's complicated because, again, remembering that David Lloyd taught us, uh, teaches us that the roles we play in these stories, they form our identity, our sense of self. And there is, friends, there is a comfort, a certainty, a security that comes along with knowing our roles and how to play them. Going back to my sister and I, there is this great comfort that I hold. There's a great comfort to me knowing that those roles that were assigned to Julie and I 50 years ago, Julie, the big sister, me, the baby brother, those roles are still available to me. But remember, there is no growth that is comfortable. I'll say that again. There is no growth that is comfortable. There is no change that offers security. So today, this is my invitation to you. This is what I invite you to do in these days and weeks ahead. I really invite you to get into this idea. I want you to notice the roles you are playing in your stories. And I mean, really notice them, like consciously going, oh, right now I am being a son. Right now I'm being a friend. Write them down if it's helpful for you. And think about it, in that interaction in the store this week, you are playing the role of customer. At work, you may be playing the role of employee or maybe the role of boss. As you do this, you'll see you're often playing many roles at the same time. At home, perhaps you play the role of husband or, or wife or spouse. Perhaps you play the role of a happily unmarried person. Or here, here in this space, you play the role of congregant, of co-minister. Maybe your role at some point during your day is gardener, or maybe it's leader, grandparent, friend. Each of these are the different roles that we play at any one moment. And then, so once you've started to focus on the roles that you're playing in the moment, I invite you then to notice the stories you're playing them. Are those stories fulfilling for you? Do those narratives give you space to live out your values? The space to grow and flourish into the wholeness and fullness of your humanity? Or perhaps you find yourself in one of these ever repeating narratives, that argument you've been having with a loved one for the last 25 years, for example. Or perhaps your narrative holds you in self-doubt, holds you in resentment, holds you in fear. So once you kind of get what role you're playing and what the story is that you're playing in, then I invite you to imagine a different role in that same story. Who might you be that could break the story wide open, fresh and new? I will warn you, friends. If you do this, if you try to change your, your role in the narrative, the world's not going to necessarily play along, not at first. They're not going to understand. The world won't understand. If you have always played the role of grandmother and you need to now play a different role in that family system, the family system's not going to understand you at first, but I invite you to stick with it. This is a spiritual moment. This is a growth moment for you and for us all. It's going to take some practice and some courage and some persistence. But friends, I believe you can turn your story into something that transforms not only you, but transforms us all. You change the role, you change the story, you change the story, you change the world. Amen, my friends. And I love you. And may we live in blessing.